Welcome inside episode 611 of the Locked On Senators podcast. I'm your host, Brandon Piller, back from the East Coast. And if you're watching on YouTube, you can probably tell my co-host Ross Levitan is not here. He's away on vacation on the West Coast in San Francisco. So we're going coast to coast with vacations. But I'm excited to be back for this episode because we have a Sen Central citizen. Evan LaSalle joins us. He tells us about how he became a Sens fan, some of his favorite Sens memories, and some predictions for the upcoming season. And I get into Sens prospects that did and didn't make their respective teams for the upcoming World Juniors tournament in the summer, and a whole lot more. So let's get into this episode. Here we go. Locked on Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today is Wednesday, August 3rd, and if you want to support this show, please go ahead and like and subscribe on YouTube. You can download our podcast wherever you get your podcast, Apple, Spotify, and be a friend, tell a friend about the Locked On Senators podcast. Well, I'm back in the podcast studio. It feels like it's been a while since I've done an episode, especially uh, just manning this pod solo, but it was great to get away on vacation. Thanks to everyone who gave me recommendations of places to go, places to eat on the East Coast in Halifax and PEI. had a great trip. It was great to unplug, but now back at it and... The Ottawa Senators offseason has slowed quite a bit as Pierre Dorian has checked off a lot of the boxes that we wanted him to. Claude Giroux, check. Josh Norris, long-term extension, check. Find another top six winger in Alex Dobrynkit. Not a big deal. Still can't believe he's an Ottawa Senator. Check on that as well. And getting rid of a lot of... uh, kind of the the contracts and players that weren't fitting into the future guys like Colin White the buyout Matt Murray bringing in Cam Talbot to now have two good veteran goalies this team is looking like it's ready for a great season and I can't wait for the season to get started it's uh it's going to be a long wait but at least to hold us down until the Ottawa Senators start their season We got a World Juniors tournament in the summer. Very, very weird. I'm still kind of wrapping my head around it. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but when I think of World Juniors, I think of Christmas. I think of New Year's. I think of uh, like uh, your semester breaks in college or throughout school. And that's what you're doing, sitting down with the family and watching World Juniors. But this is a little different. This one's happening in the summer. And Teams now have their roster set as this tournament is going to go from August 9th, that's when everything starts, to the 20th when the final games will be played. So August 9th to 20th, clear schedules because uh, we're going to have some hockey. And this is going to be a fun World Juniors too, especially for Ross and I after covering the draft so heavily. We're going to know a lot of these prospects. Uh, There are six Sens prospects heading to the World Juniors, one of them from this past draft. And uh, let's take a look at who is going to the World Juniors for the Ottawa Senators. For Team USA, we got Tyler the K-Train Clevin. So stoked that Clevin made uh, made the team. Wasn't really a surprise to anyone. And that's at least one reason if Team USA does well that uh, we can be excited about that and get our Sens, uh, Sens fans cheer and happy about that. Now, With uh, the prospect that was drafted this year by the Sens, Thomas Hamara, he will be playing for the Czech team. Levi Marilainen and Roby Jarventi will be playing for Team Finland. Those two definitely, uh, they have a lot of excitement from Sens fans. Marilainen had a decent season in the OHL and Roby Jarventi, he's still one of the younger guys. I feel like people forget how young he actually is, so... For him to be back at the World Juniors, it's going to be great. Hopefully, he can have a good showing. He didn't always have the best luck at the World Juniors. I think if Jarvetti can get hot right off the bat and get a quick goal, get that confidence going and uh, have his teammates kind of build chemistry and really utilize his slot shot, I think he's going to have a really good tournament. So I'm excited to see Jarvetti. He's going to be a big one, that's for sure. Now, let's move to the red and white team Canada Ridley Gregg I think we all knew he was going to make this team and 
stick taps to Ridley. I mean, this guy had to go through so many obstacles uh, trying to join the World Juniors before. He spent more time in quarantine than I think any uh, young player at that point, and uh, he didn't end up making the team uh, in the end. So now he gets a chance here to play for Team Canada. And Zach Astapchuk, one of our favorite prospects uh, that's really been lighting things up with the Vancouver Giants last season. He had one hell of a year and is making that uh, entire draft class look a whole lot better with his production. So those are the six Sends prospects that will be playing at the World Juniors Tournament. Now, a lot of you are probably saying, okay, there's one guy who is not on this list, a 10th overall pick. Only one Tyler playing on Team USA, and that's Tyler Clevin. Tyler Boucher did not make the Team USA team this time around. It seems like he had a really good showing, though. Scored three goals in the scrimmages, uh, or two goals in scrimmages, one on three on three play uh, in Team USA's camp. From all accounts, it seems like he was someone that really showed well. Maybe a little too much uh, grit and grind, as we know. Tata Boucher likes to get a little... uh, A little physical out there, and he did have kind of a knee-on-knee play with uh, Aiden Thompson, which did end up taking, making him injured, which is very unfortunate. Obviously, you never want to see that uh, with players playing on the same team and playing for their country. But Tyler Boucher just trying to make an impact out there, and from what it sounds like, it doesn't seem like it was um, an intentional injury. It was just a bang-bang, knee-on-knee play, and... We know we've seen that uh, with uh, the Sens players, the knee-on-knee injuries. Uh, they can really be a quick play that I don't think most guys, usually it's not intentional. And uh, if anything, it's them trying to get out of the way and move. And that's when they move in weird spots and they end up making contact knee-on-knee. So that's too bad to hear. But the thing with Tyler Boucher, and this this seems to be kind of a polarizing player with uh, Sens fans on Twitter. Look. I think we can all come to agreement. Maybe we don't love where he was picked, but that's in the past. He's a sense prospect now, and I can tell you firsthand, we've had this guy on the show multiple times. He's such a good kid. He's doing what he can to get better. He had a rough year, and he doesn't need to make excuses for the year he had, but if you look at how it went with injuries, COVID, switching from college to junior, all these kinds of things, it's really tough for a player who hasn't had a chance to play the amount of hockey that they want to really be able to pick up and uh, get things in stride for their season. So it is unfortunate that he didn't make this team. However, he was one of the younger guys there. It seems like the Team USA really wanted to stack up on the 2022 players and uh, have them show for this summer tournament. I think he has a excellent chance to make the tournament uh, when it goes back to its regular scheduling uh, in the Christmas, New Year's time. So I think Sens fans, don't be too disappointed about that. I really think, if anything, it's going to put a bigger chip on his shoulder and this guy's going to work harder to get there uh, for the next tournament. So we're disappointed that it didn't happen for Tyler Boucher, but for everyone kind of happy about this on Twitter... I I don't know. I don't honestly don't even know what to say to people in that position because this guy, he's a sense player. He's a great kid. He's done nothing in my eyes that uh, can make you say you're not cheering for this guy. So at least on this show, we're cheering for Tyler Boucher. I can tell you that for free. So hoping that uh, he can bounce back from this. And uh, yeah, like I said, I think he'll come back bigger and better for uh, uh, better for it. And look out Ottawa 67s. He's going to be hungry. That's for damn sure. So that's the kind of the quick wrap up uh, on the World Juniors from the Sens perspective here. Just a reminder, the tournament goes from August 9th to 20th. So next week, we're going to be watching World Junior Hockey. So yet again, still so weird to be saying that for um, for the summer in August. But I'm fired up nonetheless. Uh, all, the, all the moves the Sens have been making have been making me want to watch hockey more and more. It's great to unplug once in a while, but... I'm stoked for some hockey to come back on. And if you're stoked for hockey to come back on and want to make a couple shekels with your uh, wise decisions, and if you want to know where to go to find the best odds, you got to check out betonline.net. It's the trusted online sportsbook of the Locked On Senators podcast. From all the latest odds, totals, player performance props to where the next fired coach is going to land, betonline.net is your number one spot for other sports betting needs, guys. 
excuse me, it remains the best spot for all your sports scores, podcasts, and news this season. And it's not just hockey, guys. They got basketball. They got boxing. They got UFC. They got baseball. They got golf. Whatever you need, they got it at betonline.net. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. It's betonline.net, where the game starts. All right, guys, now we're going to throw it to our Send Central Citizen. It's great to be getting back into these. Uh, we, we love having you guys on the show. Like we mentioned, our whole idea for the Send Central Citizen was to give Sense fans a platform to talk on. We know TSN, Sportsnet, everyone's always talking about the Leafs, the Habs, uh, the Oilers, the Canucks. Everyone gets the coverage, but we want you to have a spot where you can voice your opinions on the Ottawa Senators and we just love uh, chatting Ottawa Senators and meeting new Sense fans and fans of the show, listeners. A reminder, if you want to be a Sense Central citizen, send Ross a message on Twitter, at Sense Central, DM him, and we can get you on a list. We have a running list. We're going to be going through Sense Central citizens in the summer because um, in the off season, it's great to catch up with everybody and see how everyone's... Uh, we like to do a vibe check. How's everyone feeling going into this season? And finally, we can do some good vibe checks where it's like, okay, not so much focused on what are you disappointed about and what needs to happen in the future versus now where it's like, how stoked are you and how ready are you for this Ottawa Senators season? So we're fired up about that. So without any further ado, let's throw it to our Sen Central citizen of today's episode. It's Evan LaSalle. All right, we now welcome on this week's Send Central Citizen. It's been a long time coming, but we are extremely happy to welcome Evan LaSalle to the show. You guys can go give him a follow on Twitter at Evan LaSalle 11. Evan, I'm pretty sure I know what the 11 is for. Is it a little homage to Daniel Alfredson? It's a little bit of both. It does. It is my favorite number because it uh, rhymes with my name, but I guess the Alfredson oh. thing is also there as well. So, yeah. Nice. And Ross, come on. You got to put the title properly now. It's Hall of Famer Daniel yes. Alfredson. There's, uh, there's titles 11. that follow uh, or yes. that uh, go ahead of Alfredson <laughs> now. And uh, so, Evan, we're going to start this off like we do most of our Sense Central citizens. When did you become a Sense fan and how did that happen? Yeah, so um, I'd like to say I've been a Sense fan since birth. Uh, nice. I was born in Toronto, um, but my dad is from Ottawa and okay. like my grandparents. Uh, so, growing up, watching hockey it was never really Leafs it was all Ottawa just because my grandpa was and my dad were the most into it uh so I've never been a Leafs fan always been a Sens fan and uh yeah just always liked the Sens and I've been following them more over like like I watched the playoff run in 2017 but like following it completely it's been like the last two years like non-stop that's awesome. What what made you flip that switch where you're like, yeah, I'm not just a casual fan anymore. Nothing wrong with that, but you were just going every single game. Well, I mean, the year after 2017 was kind of difficult to watch. So oh, I didn't really you, you can say that again. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I liked, I kind of say I wanted them to lose games just for those picks, of course. Yeah. And I couldn't bring myself to watch games that I didn't want them to win. So I <laughs> yeah. kind of just let the season ride along. And I check the standings every once in a while and be, you know, pleasantly surprised that they were lower, I guess, just knowing that the pick would be higher. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, That's it, such a sad time. I'm glad I know, what a time to, to get serious about the Ottawa Senators <laughs> the year yeah. after their long playoff run and things just went all well, the way downhill. Lots of prospects <laughs> to follow. That's fair. Yep. Yeah. Hundred percent. So when you became a sense fan, like let's let's go to the beginning because when you said you're going to birth, and I know you said you're going to to university next season. So doing some quick math on that, I'd say that you probably don't quite remember the 07 run to the oh, cup, eh? That would have been a bit been before your time. Three years old. So no, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll give you you say from birth, but we'll give you a little uh, a lean leniency yeah. here to go I mean, up. To, I guess when I say from birth, it means I've never been a fan of another team. 100%. And you've got the blue okay. background in your room, so I was a little bit nervous there. No, that's but... for the Jays. That's for the Jays. Okay. All right. Pass. We're... Yep. We... Yeah, that passes the vibe. My Sens jerseys sure. are in my closet. 
Perfect. Hey, that's a great place to start. Which uh, which players' names do you get on the back of your jersey? Is that that's kind of symbolizing who your favorite players are? Yeah. So I've got a Shabbat jersey. That's just the regular red one with the old logo. Yep. Uh, just not the new one. And then I have um, a newer one, like the black and red one with a Gachuk on the back. No C on, C on there. Oh, no okay. Kid. Before right. he was captain. And I've got a couple. I have like a uh, NHL 100 your jersey i think or something yep. like the o on it uh, that's uh, the outdoor one. game it's a healy one i didn't buy it my neighbor gave it to me <laughs> he's a leash <laughs> man but um he like collects stuff so he had a signed heatley jersey so he gave me that one all right and then i've got one of the uh old ones i think that pills he has in the back there uh, yes one of those from my dad who gave that one to me Oh, that's awesome, man. No name on it, though. No, all good. Sometimes you just need to let the logo do the talking mm-hmm. at the front of the jersey. So when when you started following the team, let's go, like, before 2017, like, we always leave out Daniel Alfredson, but yeah. who were the players that really attracted you to the team and were like, all right, I'm watching. This is my dude right here. I really liked Bobby Ryan, um, definitely because I met him. So he always had, like, you know, a special place in my heart. Especially, I think he scored, like, one of the OT goals in Boston. Yes, did he some did. some big goals on yeah. that playoff run. Yeah, yeah a little tic-tac-toe. I think it was him and uh, and Turris, and they just stood in the crease yeah. after and let everyone yeah, ball. Yeah, awesome. My favorite players would be Hoffman, Turris, Bobby Ryan from that kind of era. Just uh, – I met all three of them, so – How'd you meet them? Uh, so, I went up to Ottawa, like, a couple years ago. I would go up to Ottawa every year for a couple weeks. Uh I went to like a Sens camp down there for hockey. Cool. Um, and they'd always have, cause it's in where they um, like where development camp, like at the Sens plex. Yep. So that's where the camp takes place. So you'd always see like players skating around and stuff like that. And every week they'd have a player come in. So I think one week it was Turris, then another, it was Hoffman and then another, it was Bobby Ryan, but Bobby Ryan was out on the ice with us. Cool. That's awesome. And I like to say I did dangle him. Now, I don't know if he let me, but I like to say he didn't. So maybe I'm just that good. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Hey, it's like that Bobby versus Beer Leaguer thing. I don't know if you saw the, the little uh, mini series that Bobby Ryan would do, or <laughs> he'd do like one on one drills against just your average, you know, Beer Leaguer. And, and it was it was hilarious. Almost like a pros versus Joe's type uh, yep. concept. Remember that show, Pilsy? Yeah, that was that's, old uh, school. that's a classic. Yeah, yeah. And hey, don't let facts get in the way of a good story. If you let you or not, you can still yep. tell everyone you dang well Bobby said. Ryan. Yeah, well there said. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so what? Um, you said you go to Ottawa for a couple weeks there. So, mm-hmm. did you get a chance to go to games in person at the CTC? I did. I've been to a couple. Uh, yep. There will always be one that I remember. I don't like the one where they lost as much. I think they lost to a Jack Hughes overtime goal to one of the ones I went to. Oh, damn. Yep. But one of the ones before that, it was, I think Ottawa played the Wild, if I remember correctly. And they were down with like 30 seconds left. And I think it was uh, Zabanajad that scored a tip in or something like that with 30 seconds left. And then uh, in OT, Carlson ended, ended it with like a – bomb of a slap shot from the slot so nice. that's a game model to remember ross is probably fact checking that right now trying to no, find fact the game. Check. i'm trying to find the game of mm-hmm. course but I've been, I've been trying to go back and find it i want to watch the highlights i used to always go back and re-watch the highlights i i got it that was march 15th 2016 if mm-hmm. uh if does that sound like it could be right yeah, it sounds around the right time okay yeah yeah, well, Eric Carlson, fought, they fought back to beat the Wild 3-2 in, on Tuesday mm-hmm. in overtime. Carlson's 13th. Zabanajad sent the game to the extra period. He tied there the game go. with 7.1 seconds, seven seconds left. There Look at go. the memory on there you there. You go. Nice. Seven. That's awesome. Uh, and your boy, Mike Hoffman, got a goal in that game as well. All right, they're perfect. They all fought <laughs> on the board. So uh, turning the page over to the Ottawa Senators as we know them now, obviously no Hoffman, mm-hmm. no Carlson, no Zabanajad. We could spend all afternoon listing yeah. off every single name that's not here. But the guys who are, what are expectations for you going into this upcoming season? I mean, I'd like to say playoffs. Um, of course, I want them to make the playoffs. It's been a while since I've got to you know watch hockey past you know the regular season. So I want them to make the playoffs. I think they have a chance at it. I'm not going to guarantee it at all. I like to not be too optimistic. I don't want to get my hopes too high. They definitely have the forward core to do it. Oh, yeah. 
I just I'm worried about the defense, and I'm worried they're gonna put Zaitsev back on the first pairing because doesn't look like he's getting traded in my opinion right now. Yeah, it, it's hard to move money around, but uh, but let's yeah. let's stick to the positives. Let's leave uh, let's leave mm-hmm. Zaitsev out of this. Um, so <laughs> as you said, the forward core is looking a lot better. Yeah, what I'm interested to see, um, kind of fans and everybody uh, that follows ascends closely. How would you set up the two power play units? Okay, so oh, I Evans have ready. Love it. this. Let's go. Shabbat yeah. on the first one for sure. Okay. Right, okay. and Sanderson on the second. That's the defense setup. I think I'd have to just keep the whole first power play the same, okay. besides Batherson down to the second one and replace him with the Brinkat. Okay. Yeah. Just because I think how good it can be with both the Brinkat on one side and Norris on another, you can't cover one. Because we saw last season, teams were covering Norris a lot more because they knew he just shot from the same place. Even though it went in a lot, yeah, they can still cover it. So you really get rid of that if you have one on each side, and I think it would just be amazing. So then you get Giroux, Batherson, Sanderson. Who who are the two other guys that fill out that second unit? Oh, gosh. The whole top six is gone there. So probably, I'd probably Joseph. Probably I throw Pinto that. in that in that same Debrinket spot mm-hmm. on the second unit. Remember at okay, North Dakota, yeah. he was he was hammering pucks from yeah, from that uh, yeah. from that so spot. Probably Pinto and Joseph on there. Nice. Yeah, solid. That's a solid. I, I mean, Joe Seth's probably going to be on the PK too, so that's where you kind of wonder would he? Would yeah, you he don't want to work, like overwork him. I, but yeah. I don't know who else could take the spot. It'd just be difficult. I don't yeah. think you want to run two defensemen on a power play either. So no, probably not, eh? And and yeah, you'd have Sanderson in there over over Brandstrom as oh, as yeah, your guy. Sure. Yeah, hundred percent. You got to get Sanderson the extra playing time on the power play, especially because it's his first year. Just get him more comfortable yep. and maybe yep. some yep. easier scenarios. Like Feeling that. the puck, I like that. Mm-hmm. Bringing it up, and he's a guy that can can obviously make some deceptive moves to the neutral zone. So on zone entries, I'm sure that'll help because that's really the second unit this past year had no idea how to enter the zone. It was, it was tough to watch. So, oh yeah. The draw. Pass yeah. Time. My God. Oh um, my God. Yeah. Hopefully we don't see that anymore. I feel like they got away from it towards the end of the year though. Thankfully. Cause yeah, they were, they were sending Timmy a lot more just to go in by himself. Hundred percent, and he just like pass it off to Batherson or something like that as he got in the zone. Yeah, it was like, get speed and then just a little outlet mm-hmm. handle to to the wall and, and kind of let everything set up. And I mean Giroux's fantastic at at that mm-hmm. same part of the game too. So I think yeah, Giroux on on unit two to me is kind of a no brainer as as the the down low the bumper type guy and 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 kind of build build out from there because you're gonna get one stud off the first unit because you, yeah. you can't put the brinket on the second unit you just can't no he ha- he has to be on the first I think it's only fair to him that he has to be on the first getting yeah. traded to a new team as a two-time 40 goal scorer if you're on the second I don't know how that looks is he the best player on the team do you think yeah right now for yeah sure. I think so too um wow. I don't even think it's a hot take no it's not he's Prove that he's the best player. Yeah. He's, he's the really, highest paid too, not cap it, but in terms of salary this upcoming season. Well, sure. anyone else you would say is better. There's not, they haven't proven that they're better. Right, like if you right, say right. Batherson's better because he's been a point per game, well, that was only half a season, right? Mm-hmm. I, I'm sure he got injured, but we don't know if he would have kept that up, right? Yeah. And, Brady's uh, my number two guy, just because obviously brings like that all around package. But, but if you're going for goals, Norris hit, in the 30s and missed 16 games like what happens if he gets another 16 games he's probably a 40 goal scorer no i'm just i'm just worried about his shooting percentage next year he yeah it was high scored a lot and i was really like surprised how he kept scoring from the same spot on the power play yeah everyone knows it's coming anything else right so i thought teams like the goalie could have cheated more. I know they cheated a bit, but they could have cheated more because Ottawa didn't really have a second. You just play. can't stop him. Oh, that's not even him. Oh, I got the wrong guy. That's tough. <laughs> oh, I'll almost. get I'll there get Norris smile. And there you go. Oh, I thought it was go. him with the shades. That's tough. L for me on that one. But yeah, as as we knew it was coming. So and then this is Evan after Norris scores again. From, yeah, I know from that's the, the jersey slot. I have too. Yeah, that's awesome. Beauty. You know when this photo was taken? I guess the, the other jerseys give it away. Oh yeah, a little while ago. <laughs> That's after the Adam got debt where he God sat on a bench for the game. entire he second and played, third like, period. He played how long that game? Like <laughs> three minutes or three something. Minutes, yeah. it was, uh, <laughs> Shootout <down. laughs> specialist. And he was hyped up too after he scored. He was having the time of his life. Oh yeah, one of these. Just come here, come here. He's a Leafs player now, so he can celebrate for them. 
Yeah, yes. dude, lots of Sense fans mm-hmm. in Vancouver. I feel like that's like the biggest away crowd I've heard. That place erupted after sure. that goal. That was yeah, awesome. No, I gotta that- go out and see another game. It's been a while. I haven't seen them for before COVID. Yeah, have have you gotten yeah. to see them in Toronto or elsewhere? Uh, Toronto's a little expensive, no uh, doubt. Down here, Buffalo's probably the play for you in Burlington. Eh? Yeah, it'd probably be Buffalo. I haven't gone yet. I want to go to a um a Sens game. The problem is, like, I go up to Ottawa in the summers, and they don't. Yeah, play. Like, I'm going up. I'll be in Ottawa next week to see a Red right. Box game, but oh, sick. right. So the Sens aren't playing. I'm gonna try to get up some point. It might be a little difficult, you know, first year at university. I don't want to go right away. Right. I was looking at the home opener. I just don't know what I'm going to be doing. And it's a Tuesday. That, yeah, yeah, that's I mean, tough. That's probably not possible. That's but, tough. Yeah. Hey, fr- freshman year doesn't matter, though. Come on, just have some fun. <laughs> I don't know. <mean, laughs> the parents might disagree. Yeah, I think, I think <laughs> they would. Fair. Even my parents are listening out like, you idiot. But. I might get a little mad at me for – I mean, it would be worth it, in my opinion, but I don't know. So final one for me, Evan. We appreciate you joining us. Everyone should be following him on Twitter at Evan Lassalle 11 And yes, Evan and 11. That's a, a bit of a tongue twister for me there. So, hey, we uh, we always ask this question. We talked about the power play a little bit. But from Pierre Dorian's seat as GM, are you going full tilt as aggressive as you need to be to get that defenseman before the season? Or is this something that you think can wait until the trade deadline? I think it's got to be done before the season. The only problem is I don't know how you do it. The right-handed defensemen that are available are really, like, running low. There's not many. We saw Weir get traded, right? So we can't, yeah. you know, he's, and he's probably, he's not coming here. Um, it's just running out of options. So I'd like them to get something done before the season. I just don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, that, that's kind of where I'm at. And that's fair. Uh, last question for me, Evan here. And uh, it seems like you've got everything locked and loaded to go. So give me a hot take. Like, let's, uh, let's hear your hottest take for this season. I know you said to bring it top player, but you and Ross both kind of agree. Yeah. That's, that's not too hot of a take. So give me something a little spicier. Okay, it, this, I think by the end of the year, Timmy is the best player on the team. Nice. Yeah. See, that's where I paused when you guys said that. I was like, Timmy might be close here, he, especially he right now. If, but, but look at t- Timmy's line mates. Ross, we've talked about this. Timmy's line mates for most of the time have been what? Connor Brown and, yeah. and Formington and like a bit of too. Yeah. Guys that are good, but not quite the players he needs. Now get, give him a full season uh, with Debrinkat and Giroux. This guy could go. His potential could go through the ceiling of the CT. Even even secondary assist wise, right? Giroux is such like a disher. He can send yep. the puck easily, and Debrincat, well, like he's a sniper, right? He can score from anywhere. So even like secondary assists, pass it to Giroux, something will happen, right? So, so, so do you think Timmy could lead in points this year? Yeah, I don't know. Okay. Debrincat will have more goals, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That's point fair. wise, I think he should be able to i don't know batherson is closer right because he was point per game definitely but i feel like the like the timmy line i think will be better than the brady line so yeah, yeah. they might flip one and two uh, halfway through the season yeah i could see it the ring cat's a first line player right so that's my thought he's got to be the yep. first line uh so i think by the end of the season that line will be better I mean, the Brady line is still going to be good, of course. That's like the, that's like the old reliable line. They're always going to get something done. But I think for like goal scoring and just like that extra wow factor, that first line should be unstoppable. Yeah, Tim Stutzel played 500 minutes with Alex Formanton last year, more than anybody else. And then if we're just sticking with forwards, it's 360 minutes with Connor Brown. Then a huge drop off to 240 minutes with Brady Kachuk. And who's next? Adam Goddett. 209 <laughs> minutes at five on five. Tim yeah. Stutzel had to play with Adam Goddett. I'm shocked that Adam Goddett played 209 minutes <laughs> at five on five this year, honestly. So um, I, I like where your head's at with uh, with Tim Stutzel becoming an even better player with Alex Debrinkit and Claude Giroux on either wing. Uh, that's a hot take. We'll follow up with yeah. you next time we get you on the show, Evan. But really appreciate you joining us today. Everyone, again, go give him a follow on Twitter at Evan LaSalle 11 and we look forward to uh, getting some more hot takes out, out of your Twitter account. We'll have you back on yeah. the show soon, man. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.
All right, guys, thank you to Evan LaSalle for joining Ross and I. It was great to chat with him about the Ottawa Centers. And good luck, Evan, in your first year at U of G. That's exciting as a Guelph guy. Uh, we chatted about that for a while, so I'm, I'm stoked to see he's going to get uh, to check out University of Guelph. It's a great spot. And check out some Guelph Storm games, too. That's, uh, that's definitely something you got to do, Evan. And now, look. There's not a whole lot of uh, stuff going on with the Ottawa Centers. As I mentioned, Pierre Dorian checked off a lot of things on his checklist. So you'll love to see that. He's not a procrastinator like myself, uh, just leaving things off to the end of the summer. And it seemed like they procrastinated last offseason when all they ended up doing was bringing in Michael Delzato on a two-year deal. We all know how that went. Uh, only served one year of it. Most of that time spent in Belleville and then eventually bought out. And the Dadnov trade, which brought in Nick Holden. So other than that, they didn't do a whole lot. This offseason looked a lot different. And we talked about doing a segment uh, earlier on. We kind of got away from it. There's so much news and stuff. So I'm going to be bringing this one into circulation here. And it's our Wednesday worry segment. So yes, there's a lot of positives. The uh, forward core is looking great. You got to brink it. You got Giroux coming in. Josh Norris signed to a long-term deal. All these things are looking good. Matthew Joseph, how could I forget about that? He signed to a long-term deal as well. So there's a lot of good things on the forward side of the Ottawa Senators roster. I'm not worried about that at all. Where my Wednesday worries will come in is not uh, not specifically the D chord in general, but I've been tinkering and we've been getting very excited about the Ottawa Senators power play power plays, I should say, because this year it's not just going to be one loaded top unit and a bunch of uh, extras, we'll, we'll say, on the second unit. No more Chris Tierney, no more Adam Gaudet. We're going to have a much better looking second power play unit like Evan talked about in our Sense Central Citizen interview. So I'm going to be looking at the flip side of the special teams, and that's the penalty killing, because the Ottawa Senators, I actually thought were a pretty decent team on the penalty kill, and they were able to hold off uh, some pretty uh, good power play units going up against them. But here's the thing. You start looking, and I'm going to NHL stats right now. You start looking at the guys who put up a lot of minutes on the penalty kill. Number one guy, Nick Holden, 243 minutes on the PK. I don't, I don't see that really changing. The Senators really value his work uh, defensively, and I think he's going to be a big part of that. But then you start looking at these other names. Right behind him, Nikita Zaitsev with almost 175 minutes on the PK. Then right after him, Connor Brown, 168. He was an amazing penalty killer, even uh, getting some shorthanded goals while he was at it as well. Nick Paul, he's six on the list with 130 minutes. And Alex Formington still not signed, 150 minutes on the PK. So you're looking at uh, a lot of guys that this unit that made up a lot of the penalty killing time that arguably aren't going to be around or we're not sure of their situation or how they're going to be utilized on this team. So that's where I want to start looking. Like, <laughs> hopefully Nikita Zaitsev is not a massive part of this roster as it, it just was, it's not working out for Zaitsev in Ottawa anymore. The amount of times, uh, I guess it's good penalty killing. I was going to harp on him for icing the puck, but if you're if you're penalty killing, that's all fine. You can clear it there. But I just started to tinker around with the idea, how is this team going to shore up on the defensive side of things when it comes to the penalty kill? Which forwards are going to be taking a bigger step? So on today's YouTube page, guys, leave a comment below. Who do you think is going to be one of the forwards that really kind of helps solidify the penalty killing unit now that Connor Brown and Nick Paul won't be around? Is it going to be someone like Dylan Gambrell, who is we all know is a very defensive minded center? Is Austin Watson really going to step up and have a lot more time penalty killing? Or someone that I'm looking at and he got some PK time near the end of the season. Josh Norris, I think, could really be a guy that he can shine on a maybe a second penalty killing unit just because he's going to be playing top line minutes, top power play. So maybe that's somewhere where we see him. Matthew Joseph, we saw a little bit of that. Even Tim Stutzler, we saw uh, playing on the PK. Now, I don't think that's going to happen too much more. But I think Nick Holden, he's going to be the main defense um, player that's going to be holding down the penalty kill here. I wonder if they're going to use Jake Sanderson in that type of role. Uh, it's... Uh, He's probably going to be getting a lot of five-on-five five minutes. 
So it'll be interesting to see how he's going to be used on special teams, on the power play and on the penalty kill. And then you start looking at uh, Zub. Definitely, I think he's going to be, he was fourth in penalty kill or shorthanded time on ice, rather. So he's going to be a big part of that, obviously. So it's going to be interesting. Maybe Travis Hamannick mixes in there as well. So let me know in the comments below, guys, who you think is really going to shore up things on the penalty killing side of the special teams. All right, guys, uh, that's pretty much all I've got for today. Uh, we had a lot of talk about the Sens prospects that'll be at the World Juniors coming up next week. Fired up about that. And a little bit of a Wednesday worry with what is this team going to do with their penalty killing unit now that the roster has changed so dramatically. Before I go, though, guys, tomorrow is Ross Levitan's birthday. So make sure you're wishing Ross a happy birthday on Twitter at Ross Levitan or at Sand Central. Just, just let him know that uh, even though he's away in San Francisco, uh, we miss him and that uh, he's still appreciated. So happy birthday to Ross tomorrow, guys. And that's it for this episode of the Locked On Senators podcast. For Brandon Piller, for Ross Levitan, we say thank you for listening and watching. It's the Locked On Senators podcast, your team every day.